welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 103rd episode, our returning guest is Jonathan Fowler. You first heard Jonathan Fowler on episodes 2, 10, 20, 21, 29, 30, 31, 32, 34, 35, 43, 48, 51, 56, 64, 74, 83, 92, 102, and episode 82, which also featured fellow regular guest Ash Burgess. Jonathan graduated with a BA in history from Indiana University in 2006. He is an unabashed left-wing political junkie. He has lived and worked in South Korea for over 10 years, trying to help the citizens of that great nation hopefully talk pretty one day. And if you haven't started reading Michael Wolff's book, Fire and Fury Inside the Trump White House, consider this your official warning to start now. This episode is the second in a series in which Jonathan and I will break down the entire book. In the last episode, we covered up through Chapter 2. In this episode, we'll tackle Chapter 3. And now, on to the show. Hello. Hey, Jeff. Hey, what's up, Bob? Good. Nothing much. You out of your taxi? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm home now. Oh, good. Yeah, I just had some California pizza. Oh, how was that? It was good. I actually had the pasta, the... uh, what is it called? Uh, pepper, pesto, olio, olio, or something like that, I think. Mm. Or, no, I forget what it's called. It might be that. But, yeah, it's pretty tasty. It's got garlic and uh, sun-dried tomatoes and uh, arugula lettuce or whatever. Arugula. Like arugula, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Y- arugula. I think, it, I think that's part of your anatomy. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> you could be right. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, things are heating up, and I think uh, our uh, prediction vis-a-vis Cenk Uger at the Young Turks that uh, Rex Tillerson was on his way out turned out to be more right than anybody could have known. I guess last week, mm-hmm. so that was good. It happened before we got the episode out, but after we'd recorded it. So mm-hmm. afternoon, all. I received a call today from the President of the United States at a little after noontime from Air Force One, and I've also spoken to White House Chief of Staff Kelly to ensure we have clarity as to the days ahead. What is most important is to ensure an orderly and smooth transition during a time that the country continues to face significant policy and national security challenges. As such, effective at the end of the day, I'm delegating all responsibilities of the Office of the Secretary to Deputy Secretary of State Sullivan. My commission as Secretary of State will terminate at midnight, March the 31st. Between now and then, I will address a few administrative matters related to my departure and work towards a smooth and orderly transition for Secretary of State designate Mike Pompeo. I'm encouraging my policy planning team and undersecretaries and assistant secretaries, those confirmed, as well as those in acting positions, to remain at their post and continue our mission at the State Department and working with the interagency process. I will be meeting uh, members of my front office team and policy planning later today to thank them for their service. Uh, They have been extraordinarily dedicated to our mission which includes promoting values that I view as being very important. The safety and security of our State Department personnel, accountability, which means treating each other with honesty and integrity, and respect for one another. Most recently, in particular, to address challenges of sexual harassment within the department. I want to speak now to my State Department colleagues and to our interagency colleagues and partners at DOD and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, most particularly. To my Foreign Service officers and Civil Service colleagues, we all took the same oath of office. Whether you're a career, employee, or political appointee, we are all bound by that common commitment to support and defend the Constitution, to bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and to faithfully discharge the duties of our office. As a State Department, we are bound together by that oath. 
we remain steadfast here in Washington and at post across the world, many of whom are in danger pay situations without their families. The world needs selfless leaders like these, ready to work with long-standing allies, new emerging partners and allies, who now many are struggling as democracies, and in some cases are dealing with human tragedy, crisis of natural disasters, literally crawling themselves out of those circumstances. These are experiences that no lecture hall in an academic environment or at a think tank can teach you. Only by people going to the front lines to serve can they develop this kind of talent. To the men and women in uniform, I'm told for the first time in most people's memory, the Department of State and Department of De Defense have a close working relationship where we all agree the U.S. leadership starts with diplomacy. The men and women in uniform at the Department of Defense under the leadership of Secretary Mattis and General Dunford protect us as Americans on our way of life daily at home and abroad. As an all-volunteer military, they do it for love of country, they do it for you, and they do it for me, and for no other reason. As Americans, we are all eternally grateful to each of them, and we honor their sacrifices. The rewarding part of having leadership and partnerships in place is that you can actually get some things done. And I want to give recognition to the State Department and our partners for a few of their accomplishments under this administration. First, working with allies, we exceeded the expectations of almost everyone with the DPRK maximum pressure campaign. With the announcement on my very first trip as Secretary of State to the region that the era of strategic patience was over and we commenced the steps to dramatically increase not just the scope but the effectiveness of the sanctions. The Department undertook a global campaign to bring partners and allies on board in every country around the world, with every embassy and mission raising this to the highest levels, and at every meeting I've had throughout the year, this has been on the agenda to discuss. <clears throat> the adoption of the South Asia strategy with a conditions-based military plan as the tool to compel the Taliban to reconciliation and peace talks with the Afghan government finally equipped our military planners with a strategy which they can execute as opposed to a succession of 16 one-year strategies. This clear military commitment attracted the support of allies broadly and equipped our diplomats with a whole new level of certainty around how to prepare for the peace talks and achieve the final objectives. In other areas while progress has been made, much work remains. In Syria, we did achieve important ceasefires and stabilizations, which we know has saved thousands of lives. There's more to be done in Syria, particularly with respect to achieving the peace, as well as stabilizing Iraq and seeing a healthy government installed, and more broadly in the entire global campaign to defeat ISIS. Nothing is possible without allies and, pop and partners, though. Much work remains to establish a clear view of the nature of our future relationship with China. How shall we deal with one another over the next 50 years and ensure a period of prosperity for all of our peoples, free of conflict between two very powerful nations? And much work remains to respond to the troubling behavior and actions of the, on the part of the Russian government. Russia must assess carefully as to how its actions are in the best interest of the Russian people and of the world more broadly. Continuing on their current trajectory is likely to lead to greater isolation on their part, a situation which is not in anyone's interest. So to my colleagues in the State Department and the interagency, much remains to be done to achieve our mission on behalf of the American people with allies and with partners. I close by thanking all for the privilege of serving beside you for the last 14 months. Importantly to the 300 plus million Americans, thank you for your devotion to a free and open society. 
to acts of kindness towards one another, to honesty and the quiet hard work that you do every day to support this government with your tax dollars. All of us, we know, want to leave this place as a better place for the next generation. I'll now return to private life as a private citizen, as a proud American, proud of the opportunity I've had to serve my country. God bless all of you. God bless the American people. God bless America. Yeah. The Rexit. Yeah. yeah, the indeed. So, but it seems like more craziness is happening now. Uh, it sounds like Trump is really, really starting to push to, uh, maybe he wants to fire. Uh, I mean, he definitely wants to fire, uh, Bob Mueller, mm -hmm. try to end this investigation, and and frankly, the you know Republicans in Congress would probably let him get away with it too. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, we should probably also say another thing that happened, which was the firing of Andrew McCabe only hours before he was going to be able to pick up his full pension uh, and retire on Sunday. He was unceremoniously fired on Friday night. Um, so that was another thing that happened. And uh, we didn't see very much pushback from the Republicans on that either. So I'm sure he's just, uh, it's like in Jurassic Park, how the uh, dinosaurs start testing the uh, the electric fencing or whatever, you know, it's like they're, <laughs> they're testing their, their yeah. limits. So, well, I, I heard a very, very interesting theory on that, uh, on MSNBC somewhere. Uh, I forget which show it was called. It's about, it's got a young, kind of a youngish guy and a youngish woman on there. I forget the name of the show, but they had some people on and they said that that actually might've been a kind of an effort by Jeff Sessions to basically they, the, the theory is that apparently Trump was, this was like a loyalty test for Jeff Sessions to fire that guy. Mm -hmm. And if Jeff Sessions hadn't fired him, Jeff Sessions would have been fired, which Trump kind of wants to do anyways, because if he fires Jeff Sessions, then he can appoint a new, what is it, attorney general or something, and mm -hmm. then that person can mm -hmm. get rid of the, um, Jeff Sessions has recused himself from the Mueller probe. Mm -hmm. So Sessions can't, like, remove, remove Mueller, but somebody else could or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, Sessions so, had all those uh, on, you know, disclosed contacts with uh, Sergei Kislyak, the Russian ambassador, uh, trying to set up a back channel, maybe with uh, with old Jared. Um, so, yeah, it, it's uh, or am I mixing up a different? Uh, <laughs> well, no, he. I think I think he did have meetings with Sergei Kislyak, yeah. and that was something that he had to testify about. Mm -hmm. I mean, after Comey testified before the. Was mm -hmm. it the Senate Intelligence Committee or somebody? Mm -hmm. Then yeah. uh, Sessions got dragged in front of them to explain that situation, too. Mm -hmm. And that was a case where he invoked executive privilege, even though Trump had not actually invoked it himself. He just wanted to, like, quote-unquote, preserve it for the president if he chose to invoke it at a later date. Mm -hmm. Right. You testified a few minutes ago, I'm not able to invoke executive privilege. That's up to the president. Has the president invoked executive privilege in the case of your testimony here today? He has not. Then what is the basis of your refusal to answer these questions? Senator Kane, the president has a constitutional... I understand uh, that, I'm, but the president hasn't asserted it. Well, I'll You said you don't have the power to assert the power of executive privilege, so what is the legal basis for your refusal to answer these questions? I am protecting the right of the president to exert it, assert it if he chooses, and there may be other privileges that could apply in this circumstance. Well, I don't, I don't understand how you can have it both ways. The president can't not assert it, and you're, you've, you've testified that only the president can assert it, and yet I, I just don't understand the legal basis for your, for your refusal. So, so some of the thinking is that Jeff Sessions, might, by firing this other guy, he may have been trying to save his own, own job so that Trump wouldn't fire him and bring in somebody who could fire the special counsel. So by that, you know, crazy logic, it might have actually been a good thing that McCabe was fired like 25 hours before he was supposed to start collecting pension. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's obviously bad for him personally, but... Uh, I'm sure the tell-all book he'll eventually write will more than make up for whatever he's lost in his pension. So. <laughs> well, it sounds like I heard a Democratic congressperson somewhere was, uh, had hired him for three days or something mm -hmm. to like make him get his pension or something by giving him some sort of a job or something. Yeah. I don't know how that works because he's got to be hiring him outside of his context as an FBI 
person, right? I mean, I don't know how that works. I mean, that would be cool if that that works out. Um, but you know, I don't know if that's actually true. Just, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a twisted web, totally messy, and uh, I don't know. You know, it's a uh, kind of a scary moment because it's. I mean, like the Cambridge and Analytica stuff has really broken in the past. Oh yeah, forty eight hours too. I would say. We'll talk about uh, being obsolete before we can publish this thing. Apparently, that was only part one. Part two is they have another. Uh, well, we should probably say what they said uh, first. Uh, what it, what was it? it? Was Cambridge Analytica, this British company that helped Trump uh, win the election by stealing a bunch of Facebook data that was supposed to be for this app that tells you about your personality based on your likes? Which I think I even remember this app. I don't think. I signed up for it, well, but it doesn't matter if you signed up for it, because what they did is that there was like 200,000 people that did this voluntarily, but then by doing this, they sucked up like 50 million da- users' data, because of all, the, all the people they were friends with uh, were also, you know, they had their information uh, taken in this, and then of course, when they got the information from Facebook, it was under the guise of academic research. Of course, it wasn't, and then it was used to specifically target people, and uh, uh, that would be more likely to vote for Donald Trump, and also they uh, apparently <laughs> they apparently uh, te- you know use this to look for the dark triad of personality features and, and target that towards mm-hmm. the Trump voter. So that you know that there's a lot a lot to unpack there, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, but as yeah. far as uh, but as far as the uh, Cambridge Analytica the goes, yeah, exactly. Uh, they are uh, now also they've been uh, stung by this uh, ITV reporters in Channel, in, Four. in Channel Four in England. Yeah, they had this uh, thing I watched last night about it, uh, basically saying that they like bribe people and, and send prostitutes to people's rooms to like blackmail politicians and stuff and all this shady dealings, and they use fake news just like we knew they would so anyway our fixer is about to bring up the subject of digging dirt on political opponents and mark turnbull says he knows ex-spies in other companies who could help there are various intelligence gathering organizations that operate very discreetly to find information like that i know people who used to work for mi5 mi6 they now work for these private organizations. Private organizations. Oh, okay, okay. They will find all the skeletons in his closet quietly, discreetly, give you a report. And then, once the dirt has been dug, out it, discreetly, he goes on to say, at the right moment. Whatever the political message, subtlety is key. It has to happen without anyone thinking that's propaganda. Because the moment you think that's propaganda, the next question is, who's put that out? Yes. So we have to be very subtle. And for a client worried about anyone discovering Cambridge Analytica's involvement, they've an answer for that too. It may be that we have to contract under a different name. Uh, for Cambridge Analytica. A different entity with a different name so that no record exists with our name attached to this at all. The invisible power brokers of modern politics. But in their craft, they insist, lies a code of conduct. So we're not in the business of, of fake news. We're not in the business of lying, no. making stuff up. And we're not in the business of entrapment. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't send a, a, a pretty girl out to seduce a, a politician and then film them in their bedroom and right. then release the film. There are companies that do this. But to me, that crosses a line. This was a battle cry for electoral ethics, but how hollow it would soon sound. Finally, the man at the helm of Cambridge Analytica, CEO Alexander Nix, has agreed to meet. In a phone call first to our fixer, the final sales pitch begins. We, we are not only the, the largest and most significant political consultancy in the world, uh, but we have the, the most established 
track record. We're used to, to operating through different vehicles uh, uh, in the shadows, and um, I look forward to, to, to building a very um, uh, long-term and secretive relationship with you. It would be our final meeting with Cambridge Analytica. Mark Turnbull now joined by his boss, Old Etonian Alexander Nix. This the man who in public eulogises free and fair elections, but who in private, we're about to discover, appears to play dirty. For a company claiming not to be in the business of entrapment, listen now to Alexander Nix when our fixer raises again the topic of digging up damaging material on political opponents. And what we want to know is what is the expertise of the deep digging that you can do to make sure that the people know the true identity and secrets of these people. Uh, we do a lot more than that. Um, I mean, deep digging is interesting, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, equally effective can be just to go and uh, speak to the incumbents and to um, offer them a deal that's too good to be true and make sure that that's video recorded. You know, these sorts of tactics are very effective. Instantly having video evidence of corruption, right. putting it on the internet. And the operative you will use for this is who? Well, someone known to us. Okay, so it is somebody, you won't use a Sri Lankan person, no? Because no, then there's no, issues. No, we'll, we'll have a wealthy developer come in, somebody posing as a wealthy developer. I'm a master of disguise. Yes, <laughs> they will offer um, a large amount of money to, to the candidate to, uh, to, to finance his campaign in exchange for land, for mm. instance. We'll have the whole thing recorded on cameras, the blank account, the face of our guy, and we'll have a post on the internet. So it'll, uh, on the Facebook or YouTube or something like this, it's going to be different. Send some girls around to the candidate's house. We have lots of history of things. For example, you're saying when you're using the girls to introduce to the mini to the local fellow mm -hmm. and you're using the girls for this like the seduction mm -hmm. they're not local girls not Sri Lankan girls mm -hmm. I wouldn't have thought so no. okay. we could bring some, I mean, just, that was just an idea I'm yes. saying yeah. we could bring some Ukrainians in on, okay. on holiday with us you know? right right, right. You know what I'm saying? yes they're very beautiful Ukrainian girls they are very beautiful yes I uh, find that works very well please don't pay too much attention to what I'm saying mm. because I'm just giving you examples of what can happen, what can be done, and what, what has been done. Yes. It sounds like electoral power by expose. The poster boy of predictive analytics touting a sideline, you might think, in sex workers and stings. Ethics perhaps somewhat expendable, like the truth. I mean, it sounds a dreadful thing to say, but these are things that don't necessarily need to be true. As long as they have the can. Next comes the most illuminating account yet of potential subterfuge. To hide their role from prying eyes, Nick says they can operate in elections under a variety of guises. So often we set up a, if we, if we are working, then we can set up a, a fake IDs and um, websites. We can go in students doing research projects attached to the university. We can, um, we can be tourists. You know, right, right, right. There's so many options okay. you know, we can look at. So, um, we have lots of experience. And for added secrecy, there's always the option of subcontracting into the world of ex-spies. We've, got, we've just used a different organisation to run a very, very successful project in a um, Eastern European country where they did a really, no one even knew they were there. They just, drift, they just ghosted in, did the work, ghosted out and produced really, really good material. So we have experience in doing this. How is it done with the payment to these organizations where you're using another organization? We take care of that. We subcontract to them. So we pay you and then you will... We use um, some British companies. We use some, um, Israeli companies. Israeli people? Israeli? From Israel. From Israel. Right. Very effective in intelligence gathering. So there you have it. Democracy, data and dirty tricks. The self-proclaimed digital masterminds who may have swayed an American election, offering to influence others by means covert 
and corrupt. Mark, always a great pleasure to meet you. Huh? Great pleasure. Yeah. Amidst the secrecy and stings, they spoke of offering to bribe foreign officials. That's against the law in Britain and the US. How much of this was hype? How much the truth? We may never know. In the dark arts of democracy, Cambridge Analytica are, after all, modern masters of disguise. From one election to another, ghosting in and ghosting out. Uh, that's part one. Part two is apparently supposed to air tonight, and it's supposed to be more about the American election and them bragging that they want it for Trump and stuff. So, Tonight, the company's CEO, Alexander Nix, tells us how they put Donald Trump into the White House. Have you met with Mr. Trump? Many times. You have? We did all the research, all the data, all the analytics, all the targeting. We ran all the digital campaign, the television campaign, and our data informed all the strategy. I don't know. Our, our little people listening may know more about it than, than we will right now, but it's everything we expect, suspected just kind of laid bare. So, Yeah. And, I mean, from what I understand, was Cambridge Analytica, were they, they were originally like a product of the Mercers or they were... Oh, they still are. Yeah, Mercer absolutely. Family. Well, I mean, I've also yeah. heard the argument that they don't even really do much. It's just a conduit for you to get funding from the Mercers because this is their like preferred, you know what I mean? Because Steve Bannon was one of the uh, former leaders of Cambridge Analytica. You don't think he is now, but he was in previous times. So. Yeah. Well, he was the vice president, as I understand it, of the yes. company or of the American branch of the company. Yeah, right. I think originally Cambridge An Analytica was used to support, um, uh, what's his name, the goofy guy, uh, the, the penguin-looking dude. Uh, Ted Cruz. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so it was originally like supporting Ted Cruz, but then when Ted Cruz lost and stuff and the Mercer shifted mm -hmm. their support strongly to Donald Trump, I think that's when Cambridge Analytica came along for him. So, mm. but yeah, I mean, there's obviously, I, I think I saw today that like $40 billion worth of Facebook value has been wiped out by this uh, thing. Yeah, Facebook uh, has completely yeah. mishandled this entire th uh, thing. They've uh, blocked the whistleblower who blew the whistle on this from their platforms, uh, Instagram and Facebook. So very simplistically, you're going into the code behind the Facebook page. You're dragging out these ID numbers. You're putting them into, a, into an algorithm. And, and out, out comes a prediction of how you're likely to vote. Yes. Simple and smart. Because the app didn't just mine the respondents' data, crucially it swept up that of their friends too, those who hadn't adjusted their privacy settings. Imagine I go and ask you, I say, hey, if I give you a dollar, two dollars, could you fill out the survey for me? Just do it on this app. And you say, fine, right? I don't just capture what your responses are. I capture all of the information about you from Facebook. But also, this app then crawls through your social network and captures all of that data also, so by you filling out my survey, I capture 300 records on average, right? And so that means that all of a sudden, I only need to engage 50,000, 70,000, 100,000 people to get a really big data set really quickly. And it scaled really quickly. It, we were able to get upwards of 50 million plus uh, Facebook records in the span of a couple months. 50 million? Yeah, over 50 million records from Facebook using this, using this method. And how many of those people behind those profiles were aware that their profiles had been used in this way? Almost none. Almost none. And so, claims Wiley, began a Republican big data gold rush with Steve Bannon, alt-right ideologue, later a Cambridge Analytica vice president, leading the charge. Should those friends' profiles have been used in the way that they were? I don't think so. I think that um, you know, it was a big mistake to use this method. Um, but why Facebook didn't, you know, make more inquiries when they started seeing that, you know, tens of millions of records were being pulled this way, you know, d I don't know. You would have to ask Facebook that. But Facebook, at least in a technical sense, facilitated the project because they, they had applications that had these permissions in the first place. Facebook learned of this in 2015, and yet it's taken them until today to come out publicly and say this never should have happened. 
they've yet to acknowledge that this involved around 50 million users, instead talking of 270,000 plus friends. They've also been at pains to stress this wasn't a data breach in the sense that users by consent and friends through their default privacy settings agreed to Dr Kogan capturing their data and they say they've since improved their systems. But Kogan, according to Facebook, lied to them and violated their policies by passing on the data to Cambridge Analytica. At the time that you were taking this data off Alexander Kogan, which was yeah. principally solely for academic research purposes, you knew you were treading a very thin ethical line, presumably. I think, I think, everyone, I think, I think everyone knew that you know, we were wading into a gray area. Um, it, be, it, it, it was an instance of, if you don't ask questions, you won't get an answer that you don't like. Cambridge Analytica rejects this, arguing they had assurances from Dr. Kogan that his actions were in line with Facebook's protocols. Kogan, in turn, claims he had the right to use it for commercial purposes. They and Chris Wiley all assured Facebook some time ago that they deleted the data as requested. But Facebook have now revealed some of that data reportedly might still exist. Hence their dramatic decision to suspend Cambridge Analytica, Alexander Kogan and Chris Wiley from Facebook while they investigate. Did you delete it immediately as requested? I had already deleted it. I had, I, when they sent me, when they sent me the, um, the, the letter that you're referring to, I didn't have the data. So Did they um, check that you'd deleted the data? No, they were just satisfied with the form. The only, the only contact that I had was, here's a form, fill it out and send it back and it's done. So they, they took your word for it that you had deleted the data of over 50 million f Facebook profiles? Yeah, they, they didn't, didn't do anything aside from sign this form. So just how significant was this data anyway? Of no use is Cambridge Analytica's position. Fruitless is how their boss described the project to MPs recently here in Westminster. Yet Chris Wiley claims it was anything but and foreshadowed worse to come. We spent almost a million dollars doing this. It wasn't some tiny pilot project. It was the, the core of what Cambridge Analytica became. It allowed us to, to move into the, 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 the hearts and minds of American voters in a way that had never been done before. They've, uh, they've not really been forthcoming at any turn unless they've had to be about this. Uh, it's just, it's bad. It's so bad. Yeah. Well, I mean, people are talking about like boycotting Facebook and I'm like, I'm not going to do that. You know, I've got <laughs> connections on Facebook to people, you know, who aren't alive anymore, frankly. And, you know. So, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. Facebook is, Facebook's a fact of life. Now, you know, Mark Zuckerberg needs to, you know, get his head out of his ass. He can't have it both ways. You, you know, you're in this thing, your platform was abused by certain people and, you know, you need to, uh, you need to regulate, you know, mm -hmm. get in there. You know, it, it, if you piss off like, you know, 30% of the electorate in America, uh, I think that's a small price to pay for. I mean, uh, frankly, those are the people that are abusing it. They're mm -hmm. absorbing fake news like their main. They're the, like, they're what, what do they call it when you like? They're basically freebasing fake news constantly, <laughs> <laughs> spreading it, yeah. infecting the system. You know, hacking the election and so forth. You know, in whatever ways. I mean, yeah. like, I mean, they're. If you piss these people off, uh, nobody gives a shit. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people, reasonable people, <laughs> the people you want to attract. Right, exactly. Well, and I love their, like, fallback position when they're, like, especially that quote, famous quote from Mark Zuckerberg right after the election was like, well, it's just ridiculous to think that we had anything to do with influencing people on the election. You know, I've seen some of the stories that you're talking about around this election. You know, personally, I think uh, the, the idea that you know, fake news on Facebook, uh, of which you know it's a it's a very small amount of of um, of the content. 
uh, influence the, in the election in any way, I think, is a, a pretty crazy idea. That's one side of his mouth. And then on the other side of his mouth, he's like, oh, but by the way, we're the most effective uh, ad platform ever created and give us money to, like, you know, push your product and we'll, you know, get it in the heads of people. You know what I mean? Like, so they want to have it both ways. And it's just not, they can't have it. They have to pick one. Are you a platform? Are you a media company? Does advertising work? Does advertising not work? You got to you gotta decide here, man. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and the thing is, there's talk of a class action lawsuit. And frankly, what some some news organization needs to do is they need to put together a list of the, what was it, 50 million people they say were exposed, and they need to publish it publicly so that people can find out if their name's on that list and if they should be a part of something. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I mean, like, you can go after Facebook if you want to. To some degree, I'm sympathetic to Facebook in that, you know, Facebook is kind of an original thing. It's like it's never been done before, this kind of thing, with this broad of a reach. And number two, this kind of an intelligence campaign, disinformation campaign, and abuse of a such an open system, um, I don't want to say it was incomprehensible before because probably there were, you know, people out there who could comprehend it. And obviously, there were people who did it. But... You know, it didn't happen in 2012, as far as we know. It didn't happen in 2008, as far as we know. It didn't happen in, what was the last one, 2006, before that? Mm -hmm. I forget what the previous election was. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 2012, 2008, 2004, I suppose. Um, so, I mean, like, for them to have been blindsided by this is not a crime, I don't think. Um, unless, you know, people in, internally were raising the red, red flag about this. Mm -hmm. But... You know, Cambridge Analytica, if they're holding your Facebook information and your name and you didn't sign up for any of this stuff, sue the, sue the fuck out of them, I'd mm -hmm. say. You know, and where right. do I sign up? And I wouldn't be surprised if my name was on that list. I mean, like, how many What? I'm going to ask Siri right now. Here, hold up. Let me look. Siri, what's the population of the United States of America? As of 2017, the population of United States of America was 325,145,960. Okay, 325,000,000. Mm. So out of 325,000, 50 million have been uh, exposed by this, this thing. Yeah. So, you know, what does that tell you? That tells you there's a, there's a very good chance that <laughs> your name could be on that list mm -hmm. and, like, you know, Cambridge Analytica, frankly, and perhaps the Mercers and perhaps the Trump campaign and perhaps even Facebook, you know, probably deserve to get sued for this. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Mark Zuckerberg would do himself a lot of favors if he just embraced radical transparency about this thing. Hey, mm -hmm. the Russians and the Mercers and certain right wing uh, uh, outside groups uh, took advantage of our platform and this is what they did. And we found out about it here and now, and this is what we're doing about it. And we think you should know about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Obviously like banning the guy who exposed it. I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's not a good look for Facebook, mm -hmm. right? I mean, no. and they're, and they're doing this to what, to hold on to like the 30% of Americans who are never going to stop supporting Trump. It's like, let it go. Mm -hmm. Those people are either going to come to their senses someday or they're going to go out and try to create their own alternative, like Facebook, right-wing, conservative Facebook website or something. I mean, Those never uh, work out, though. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, like, there's no, you know, you're Facebook. They come to you. They're not going to, you know, if they go away, like, it's not going to work. Yeah, what are they going to do? Go back to MySpace? <laughs> yeah, create their own thing. I mean, like, it's, you know... Yeah, your Facebook, they have to deal with you. You mm -hmm. don't have to, like, try to cater to them necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, they can try to create their own little thing. They, they do this all the time. Like, whenever the, like, prominent right-wing trolls get banned off of Twitter, they try to go to this alternate site called Gab. And uh, it's, mm -hmm. like, a ghost town, apparently. And there's, like, only, like, a couple thousand active users. And it's it's just, like, the most vilest people that couldn't get, like, a, a Twitter account just, just go there whenever they're kicked off. They've got one waiting for Donald Trump whenever he gets kicked off of Twitter, which he never will now. But uh, it seems he ever did they've they've got it one pre pre-made for him so <laughs> hmm. yeah well like i mean if you cheat or hack or like you know use bad language too much or something on like xbox live 
I think they, they ban your account for some time or they make it so you can't play with other people for some time or something mm-hmm. like that. And uh, I think I've heard there was one game somewhere, I don't know if it was Xbox or PC or what, but like they didn't actually ban your account or prevent you from playing with other people, but they did constrain you to a place where you had to play with other people who were also banned for similar <laughs> violations. <laughs> Which is... Ultimately, I think that's 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 the correct response. I think because then you've got it's like prison you're stuck with other people who could not follow the the rules of society, and so now they're stuck with other like sociopaths who don't give a fuck either. Oh my gosh, you know, this sucks. Probably, this is, this right? is like, like the creation of Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but yeah. I, I, I've heard Australia's lovely this time. No, year. no, I'm sure it's I'm lovely sure now, it's yeah. Come long, it's come a long way, but yeah, they, I mean, as far as founded by criminals, basically, or, you know, a penal colony or whatever. So, but yeah, I think something like that. I mean, if, if conservatives want to, you know, if they get pissed off at Mark Zuckerberg because he won't let them play their little games on his website mm-hmm. and they want to go try to create their own thing, they're going to be, you know, it's going to be basically like InfoWars, probably InfoWars.net or something like as far as like a network or whatever that yeah. just, you know, people who, and they're, and they're going to, it's not going to be fun for them because like, <laughs> You know, half the people they know who are not in their bubble are not going to be friends with them over there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be, you know. Well, but but as as much as those media empires that you mentioned, like Infowars, do operate on their own, they also rely very heavily on traditional means. I mean, uh, we had I don't you probably missed this because you're not on Twitter, but the uh, uh, Alex Jones uh, it ne- has nearly been kicked off of, of YouTube. Like that, there's like a three strike oh, system. And he's like I, on strike number YouTube. two or something. Anyway, he's like mm-hmm. begged like the kid, one of the Parkland, Florida kids, uh, David Hogg, on Twitter to like talk to YouTube to like get them to take the strike away. And like he's like, you don't understand. I didn't say you were a crisis actor. I only said it was a possibility. Or something like. Yeah, <laughs> it's like he's he's he, but these these people know that they need the mainstream to leech off of. That's the whole troll thing. They don't have their own thing. They just they they take something that's in the culture and twist it for their own purposes. You know what I mean? Um, so they, they need those traditional channels. Like they, as much as they want to say that they're, they can do it on their own. They can't, they just, ha- they just have to have a mainstream culture that they can be this barnacle on the side of, you know? Yeah. So. Well, as Obama said, you didn't build that. If you've been successful, you don't, you didn't get there on your own. You, you didn't get there on your own. I, I'm always struck by people who think, well, it must be because I was just so smart. There are a lot of smart people out there. It must be because I worked harder than everybody else. Let me tell you something. There are a whole bunch of hard-working people out there. If you were successful, somebody along the line gave you some help. There was a great teacher somewhere in your life. Somebody helped to create this unbelievable American system that we had that allowed you to thrive. Somebody invested in roads and bridges. If you got a business, that you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. The internet didn't get invented on its own. <laughs> right. Yeah. Still true in 2018. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. So anyways, um, how are you doing on the book? Oh, I'm doing all right. Uh, yeah, we, we haven't uh, done too much uh, this episode, I guess, thus far. <laughs> We're about 20 minutes in. Um, I'm going to have to go to work here eventually, so I can't do a super long episode, but um, I can yeah, probably go like another good. half an hour or so. But um, Okay. Yeah, did you want to try to do more of the book, or did you want to just uh, do a, the off-book episode? <laughs> Well, I, I figured we could do a chapter or two. I mean, we got people into it perhaps last week. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Let's know, do it. How, have you, how's your reading going? I mean, how far into it are you? I'm, I'm actually pretty close. I'm within about probably 50 pages of the end. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, you're a little further than I am, but I think I'm too, like, it was still about a chapter 11, 12 or something like that. So let me look at the table of contents here. I think we got through chapter two last time talking about it, but let's see. I yeah. Am... I'm in chapter 19, Mika Who? <laughs> 
All right. Well, chapter three is called Day One. Right. This is obviously day one is the the, the campaign promise uh, that every president makes. You know, on day one, this is, well, I'm going to sign this. I'm going to do this. We're going to do this. Right. Mm-hmm. And Trump made a lot of promises. And actually, even by the end of year one, he had accomplished remarkably little. Mm-hmm. But it starts off talking about Jared Kushner. They say Jared Kushner, at 36, prided himself on his ability to get along with older men. Um, and kind of the, the the relationship with Kushner and, you know, main, the mainstream, I guess. They say having a line to Kushner seemed to offer an alarm delete, a handle on a volatile situation. So people thought that, you know, by being close with Kushner, they could, you know, perhaps get their get their advice up to the president and get him to kind of act rational. Mm-hmm. Um, and let's see. Uh, what, what, what is one of uh, one of Trump's circle of confidants also told Kushner, he said, I give him good advice about what he needs to do. And for three hours the next day, he does it. And then he goes hopelessly off script. Uh, Kushner, whose pose was to take things in and not give much back, said he understood the frustration. Mm -hmm. Um, These powerful figures tried to convey a sense of real world politics, which they all claimed to comprehend at some significantly higher threshold than the soon to be president. They were all concerned that Trump did not understand what he was up against, that there was simply not enough method to his madness. Um, Each of these interlocutors uh, provided Kushner with something of a tutorial on the limitations of presidential power. And on, on the next page, page 41, what Kushner was told again and again is that the president had to make amends. He had to reach out. He had to mollify. Uh, these were forces not to be trifled with, was said with utmost gravity. So a lot of warning, a lot of warnings and people trying to perhaps take advantage of a relationship with Kushner. Mm-hmm. And um, I know in the last episode you had said that this, you had said that this book is largely seems to be coming from the Bannon perspective. Mm-hmm. And it, I think I pushed back on that a little bit, but the more, the further I've read, the more I get that sense that, mm-hmm. yeah, like, I mean, like, just constant, like, Darison for the, uh, for the Jarvanka mm-hmm. uh, faction. Well, I didn't even know what Jared's voice sounded like for the longest time. It was only until he made that speech or whatever, being like, oh, I was not with any Russians or whatever, like, Michael Sierra or whatever. <laughs> My name is Jared Kushner. I am senior advisor to President Donald J. Trump. When my father-in-law decided to run for president, I served his campaign the best I could because I believe in him and his ability to improve the lives of all Americans. And now, serving the president and the people of the United States has been the honor and privilege of a lifetime. I am so grateful for the opportunity to work on important matters such as Middle East peace and reinvigorating America's innovative spirit. Every day I come to work with enthusiasm and excitement for what can be. I have not sought the spotlight. First in business and now in public service, I have always focused on setting and achieving goals and have left it to others to work on media and public perception. Since the first questions were raised in March, I have been consistent in saying that I was eager to share any information I have with the investigating bodies, and I've done so today. The record and documents I have voluntarily provided will show that all of my actions were proper and occurred in the normal course of events of a very unique campaign. Let me be very clear. I did not collude with Russia, nor do I know of anyone else in the campaign who did so. I had no improper contacts. I have not relied on Russian funds for my businesses. And I have been fully transparent in providing all requested information. Donald Trump had a better message and ran a smarter campaign, and that is why he won. 
suggesting otherwise ridicules those who voted for him. It is an honor to work with President Trump and his administration as we take on the challenges that he was elected to face. Creating jobs for American people, keeping America safe, and eliminating barriers to achieving the American dream. Thank you very much, and I look forward to taking questions from the House Committee tomorrow. Thank you. I didn't even know what his voice sounded like before then, so... Yeah, yeah. These, these people, we see them constantly. We don't hear much from them. Yeah. yeah. I do feel like but once you get Steve like Bannon talking, he'll uh, probably not be quiet for a long time, so... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Um... Let's see. What, what, okay, there's a section here that I marked true in places. Um, let's see. Trump's criticism seemed, I think he's, his criticism of the intelligence agency seemed to align him with the left in its half century of making a boogeyman of American intelligence agencies. But in quite some reversal, <clears throat> the liberals and the intelligence community were now aligned in their horror of Donald Trump. Much of the left, which had resoundingly and scathingly rejected the intelligence community's unambiguous assessment of Edward Snowden as a betrayer of national secrets rather than a well-intentioned whistleblower, now suddenly embraced the intelligence community's authority in its suggestion of Trump's nefarious relationships with the Russians. I don't know. I think that that's, you know, there's, I think there's some truth in that, in that, like, yeah, I thought Edward Snowden was not necessarily a bad guy, mm-hmm. you know, before this election. But, you know, it's obviously, like, the fact that these people clearly didn't like Hillary Clinton, mm-hmm. they thought they could get a better deal, perhaps, with Donald Trump, and maybe they will. But WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, uh, Edward Snowden, all of these guys have, I don't know. It's been disappointing to see right. the direction that they've gone in this era. I well, guess. I mean, yeah, I, I feel the same way about Edward Snowden that you do, and it's been inter- it has been interesting to see the shift. But I feel like it's almost reactionary to what we've seen from the other side. I mean, the one, the two things I knew about Republicans for most of my life until this last couple of years here has been Russia is bad and law enforcement is good. Those are the two like Republican tenants as far as I knew, and mm-hmm. now it's completely flipped on its head russia is good and the fbi is bad or something (laughs) like that's you know it's total reversal from them so it's almost reflexively like hey wait a minute what (laughs) like it's like no it's not i don't feel like i changed so much as i think the world around me has changed or at least the republican world around me yeah well i i don't know it is it is a complicated flip and but i think the fact that you know I mean, yeah, the FBI has done some bad things, and the CIA has certainly done some very unsavory things in Mm -hmm. lots of parts of the world. But, I mean, the fact is, if we're about to lose our country to Donald Trump, then, you know, we are largely relying on institutions more than individuals to, uh, you know, preserve the nation, basically. Yeah, yeah. Like like I think we've even said on the show before, uh, you know, team deep state, you know, (laughs) go deep state. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, to the to the extent that they're, I mean, right to the extent that even I mean, exists, right? It's more of a right wing talking point than anything. But um, yeah, well, I think I mean, if you ask what the deep state is to ten different people, you'll get a lot of different mm-hmm. answers. Yeah, sure. Different. I think I mean, there's something that exists. I mean, there is like, I think later in in one of the recent chapters I was reading, he talks about uh, the degree to which bureaucracies are resistant to change, mm-hmm. which. You know, you can look at that as a bad thing, and you can look at that as a good thing. I mean, there's obviously good and bad aspects to it. I mean, the good thing is that when a person like Trump comes in, these institutions are not going to automatically necessarily bow to him. Mm-hmm. They're going to try to preserve the way things have been. On the other hand, like, you know, I think one of the central ambiguities of the Trump presidency that I've been wrestling with is that if a truly, you know, visionary president came in, uh, there would, and he had good ideas, Unlike Donald Trump, I mean, there would be this automatic resistance to those ideas and this kind of this bureaucratic pushback when, you know, maybe there shouldn't be in mm. in a, that kind of a hypothetical case. But so in that in that respect, I can kind of understand the uh, resentment of the quote unquote deep state. But mm-hmm. 
but you know yeah thank goodness for it right now as far as checking this guy to some degree Mm -hmm. well i mean the congressional republicans certainly aren't doing it so somebody's got to yeah well did you see i mean uh lindsey graham trotted out his whole thing that if uh the other day that uh if Donald Trump tries to fire, uh, you know, uh, the Bob Mueller, then that would be the beginning of the end of his presidency. The president has tweeted uh, this morning and last night questioning Mueller's team, saying that, quote, the Mueller probe should never have been started. <clears throat> you have said in the past that if President Trump were to order the firing of special counsel Mueller, that would, quote, be the end of Trump's presidency. Are, are you worried or concerned at all that he's preparing to fire Mueller? Let me be really clear about this. Uh, What Mr. McCabe did has absolutely nothing to do with the Mueller investigation. The dossier, I think, was mishandled by the FBI. I think was inappropriately used and presented to the FISA court. That's a separate issue uh, uh, than the Mueller investigation of the Trump organization regarding Russia. They're separate in time. They're not connected in any way. The only re- reason Mr. Mueller could ever be dismissed is, because, uh, is for cause. I see no cause when it comes to Mr. Mueller. He needs to be able to do his job independent of any political influence. I pledge to the American people as a Republican to make sure that Mr. Mueller can continue to do his job without any interference. I think he's doing a good job. And everything about McCabe and uh, the FBI handling of the dossier has nothing to do with the Russian investigation regarding Mr. Mueller. Are you worried that the president is preparing to order the firing of Mueller? It sure looks that way from his tweets. Well, as I said before, if he tried to do that, that would be the beginning of the end of his presidency because we're a rule of law nation. Which is something that I feel like he said six months ago. Mm -hmm. As a human being, I think he should show some respect uh, for Jeff Sessions as a person. Uh, Jeff Sessions was the most loyal supporter of Donald Trump. He's a rock solid conservative. But the reason I like him so much is I often disagree with him, but I've never believe that he was a man who would who lacks integrity or sense of fair play this effort to basically marginalize and humiliate the attorney general is not going over well in the senate i don't think it's going on over well in the conservative world if you believe jeff sessions should be fired use the power you have uh, and accept the consequences i hope it stops i'm 100 percent behind jeff sessions the chairman of the Judiciary Committee sent a pretty chilling uh, tweet yesterday. Uh, there will be no confirmation hearing for a new attorney general in 2017. Uh, if Jeff Session is fired, there will be holy hell to pay. Uh, any effort to go after Mueller could be the beginning of the end of the Trump presidency, unless Mueller did something wrong. But I don't believe Lindsey Graham at this point because... Yeah, he. I mean, he he tried to bring criminal charges against uh, Christopher Steele. Uh, Christopher Steele. Yeah. For, for basically doing something that they should have been doing themselves. Extremely patriotic. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's not even an American extremely... citizen. He's more patriotic than these people. So. Yeah, this is a, a very patriotic, non-American opposition research that was done. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you know, come on, Lindsey Graham, bring some charge. If you're going to bring some charges against a. Uh, uh, a British intelligence uh, company. How about Cambridge Analytica? Yeah, no right kidding, now? right? <laughs> yeah. Um, then they talk about his inauguration, anyways, in this book, which was extremely amusing. It says Trump did not enjoy his own inauguration. <laughs> he had hoped for a big blowout. Um, he had hoped to create an event that seemingly quite at odds with the new president's character and with Steve Bannon's wish for a no-frills populist inauguration. Uh, he promised would have a soft sensuality and poetic cadence. <laughs> Hold on, I've got I've got my meditation bell going off over here. It's 9, 9 p.m. in Korea now. Uh, I don't know why I leave this thing on my iPad because... Uh, I've never once actually meditated to it. <laughs> I, I tried meditating a couple times, and like one time it just gave me a headache. I didn't have to do it anymore. Okay, meditation time has passed. Okay. Um, How refreshing. Yeah, I feel better already. <laughs> so, <laughs> that seemingly quite at odds with the new president's character and with Steve Bannon's wish for a no-thrills populist inauguration. 
uh, Rob Lowe promised would, that it would have a soft sensuality and a poetic cadence. Uh, but Trump imploring friends to use their influence to nail some of the A-level stars who were snubbing the event started to get angry and hurt that stars were determined to embarrass him. Bannon, a soothing voice as well as a professional agitator, tried to argue the dialectical nature of what they had achieved without using the word dialectical <laughs> because, <laughs> because Trump's success was beyond measure or certainly beyond all expectations. The media and the liberals had to justify their own failure, he explained to the new president. Um, later that evening, a concert at the Lincoln Memorial, part of an always awkward effort to import pop culture to Washington, ended up absent any star power, with Trump himself taking the stage as the featured act, angrily insisting to aides that he could outdraw any star. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, uh, dissuaded by his staff from staying at the Trump International Hotel in Washington and regretting his decision, the president-elect woke up on inaugural morning complaining about the accommodations at Blair House, the official guest residence across the street from the White House. Too hot, bad water pressure, bad bed. His temper did not improve. <laughs> Um, th throughout the morning, he was visibly fighting with his wife, who seemed on the verge of tears, and would return to New York the next day. Um, almost every word he addressed to her was sharp and peremptory. Uh, Kellyanne Conway had taken up Melania Trump as a personal PR mission, promoting the fir new first lady as a vital pillar of support for the president and a helpful voice in her own right and was trying to convince Trump that she she could have an important role in the White House. But, in general, the Trump's relationship was one of those things nobody asked too many questions about. <laughs> Another mysterious variable in the presidential mood. <laughs> <laughs> I, I liked how you were saying during the uh, campaign how there wasn't even, like, a fake story of how they met. You know what I mean? Like how they usually have for these political couples. Like it's like he was at the dining yeah. hall. I was going to class or whatever. It's like, there's not. There's yeah. not even thing to try. <laughs> I, I saw him looking at me in the library, and one day I went up to him and said, "Hey." He said, "Hey." <laughs> Six months later, we was married and pregnant. <laughs> I mean, that's maybe the law library. I don't know. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's but, always the law library. Sure. Yeah. Very smart. Yeah. intelligent college students absolutely you know it wasn't i looked across the room uh she was doing a keg stand i fell in love <laughs> we hooked up we smooshed i mean that's that might be more honest college story wouldn't it yes it would be <laughs> less palpable to the uh to the general public i guess but yeah to some voters mm -hmm. yeah right uh, let's see here. Well, let's see. Um, at the ceremonial meeting of the soon-to-be new president and the soon-to-be old president at the White House, which took place just before they set off for the swearing-in ceremony, uh, Trump believed the Obamas uh, acted disdainfully, very ar arrogant, unquote, toward him and Melania. Instead of wearing a game face, going into the inaugural events, the president-elect wore what some around him had taken to calling his golf face. Angry and pissed off, shoulders hunched, arms swinging, brow furled, lips pursed. This had become the public Trump, truculent Trump. Uh, let's see. Uh, they talk about Trump, Bannon's plan for the inauguration, but Bannon had a diff had three messages or themes he kept trying to reinforce with his boss. His presidency was going to be different, as different as any since Andrew Jackson's, and he was supplying the less than well read president elect with Jackson's related books and quotes. Um, they knew who their enemies were, and they shouldn't fall in the trap of trying to make them their friends, because they wouldn't be. And so, from day one, they should consider themselves on a war footing. While this spoke to Trump's combative counterpuncher side, it was, a, it was hard on his eager-to-be-liked side. Bannon saw himself as managing these two impulses, emphasizing the former and explaining to, to his boss why having enemies here created friends somewhere else. Um, 
In fact, Trump's aggrieved mood became a perfect match for the Bannon-written aggrieved inaugural address. Much of the 16-minute speech was part of Bannon's daily joy de guerre. There's another thing I had to look up. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's French. I assume it means happiness of war or joy at being at war or something, something like, like that. Something like that, yeah. The, mm-hmm. Yeah, the joy of being in a high-stress or combative environment. Yeah. So, yeah, m- much of it, the 16-minute speech was part of that. Um, his take back the country, American first carnage everywhere vision for the country but it actually became darker and more forceful when filtered through trump's disappointment and delivered with his golf face the administration purposefully began on a tone of menace a bannon driven message to the other side of the, that the country was about to undergo profound change trump's wounded feelings his sense of being shunned and un- unloved on the very day he became president helped send that message. When he came off the podium after delivering the speech, delivering his address, he kept repeating, nobody will forget this speech. George W. Bush on the dice uh, supplied what seemed like it seemed likely to become the historic footnote to the Trump address. That's some weird shit. <laughs> so, that was yeah. fun. Yeah. Uh, they, they continue here. Trump's Trump, despite his disappointment with Washington's failure to properly greet and celebrate him, was, like a good salesman, an optimist. Salesmen, whose primary characteristic and main asset is their ability to keep selling, constantly recast the world in positive terms. Discouragement for everyone else is merely the need to improve reality for them. By the next morning, Trump was soliciting affirmation of his view that the inauguration had been a great success. That crowd went all the way back. That uh, that were more than a that were more than a million people at least, right? I think it's another typo there. I feel like that's a typo. That has to be a typo. I don't even think Trump would screw that up that badly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That were more than a million. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, typo. Okay, I'm going to mark that in the book here. Yeah. Um, He made a series of phone calls to friends um, who largely yesed him on this. Kushner confirmed a big crowd. Uh, Conway did nothing to dissuade him. Priebus agreed. Bannon made a joke. (laughs) Uh, Among Trump's first moves as president was to have a series of inspirational photographs in the West Wing replaced with images of big crowd scenes at his inaugural ceremony. Uh, Bannon had come to rationalize Trump's reality distortions. Trump's hyperbole, exaggerations, flights of fancy, improvisations, and general freedom toward and mangling of the facts were products of the basic lack of guile, pretense, and impulse control that helped create the immediacy and spontaneity that was so successful with so many on the stump, while so horrifying to so many others. Um, for Bannon, Obama was the North Star of aloofness. Politics, says Bannon, with an authority that belayed the fact that until the previous August he had never worked in politics, is a more immediate game than he ever played it. Trump was, for Bannon, a modern-day Williams Jennings Bryan. Bannon had long talked about the need for a new Williams Jennings Bryan in uh, right-wing politics, with friends assuming Bannon meant himself. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century, Brian had enthralled rural audiences with his ability to speak passionately and extemporaneously for uh, apparently unlimited periods of time. Trump compensated in the theory of some intimates, including Bannon, for his difficulties with reading, writing, and close focus with an improvisational style that produced, if not exactly a Williams Jennings, William Jennings Bryan effect, certainly close to the exact opposite of the Obama effect. <laughs> well, <laughs> mission accomplished, I guess. <laughs> yeah, ladies and gentlemen, we got him. They, and then they start talking about the lies, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. While the advantages of this style for the Trump team were now very clear, the problem was that it often, in fact regularly, produced assertions that were not remotely true. 
this had led increasingly to the two different realities theory of Trump politics. In one reality, reality which encompassed most of Trump's supporters, his nature was understood and appreciated. He was the anti-wonk. He was the counter-expert. His was the gut call. He was the everyman. Um, he was jazz. Some in the telling made it rap. Everybody else an earnest folk music. In the other reality in which resided most of his antagonists, his virtues were grievous, if not mental and criminal flaws. In this reality lived the media, with which its conclusion of a misbegotten and bastard presidency believed it could diminish him and wound him and wind him up and rob him of all credibility by relentlessly pointing out how literally wrong he was. The media adopted a shocked, shocked morality. Sorry, the media adopting a shocked, shocked morality could not fathom how being factually wrong was not an absolute ending in itself. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, again, this is where I think uh, his powers kind of fail him because this is, again, the meta analysis that I don't really think he has any facility for. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like he's offering an opinion on the media's opinion that Trump being wrong is a problem. Yeah. It's, and his opinion is like that maybe it's not. I yeah, mean, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like this is, this is the thing, this is a, this is kind of a recurring, I mean, he kind of tries to place himself in the middle or something. And we, again, we really don't know his politics. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, that's important. And you know, to pretend that, you know, oh, those those hoity-toity media people who want every, you know, want a president not to lie. Oh, gosh, they're elitist assumptions. It's like, no, that's a pretty reasonable thing. I mean, like, you know, yeah. every politician lies to some degree, but this is above and beyond. And, you know, the, the, you know, there's a reason. Like, I mean, when they talk about World War II, they talk about the Nazis. They talk about the great lie, right? It's right. Like, you make a lie big enough that people shouldn't believe it, but you say it again and again, and they do start to believe it. And once they've bought into that lie, basically, like, you know, anything can come next, basically. So yeah. uh, I'm, I'm kind of butchering the <laughs> the situation there. But, like, it does matter. You know, it, it, it does fucking matter, Michael Wolf, when people, when somebody on the, you know, like the president mm -hmm. is allergic to telling the truth, basically. Mm -hmm. so. Exactly. Uh, in Bannon's view, number one, Trump was never going to change. Number two, trying to get him to change would surely cramp his style. Number three, it didn't matter to Trump supporters, I guess, if he lies. Mm -hmm. Number four, the media wasn't going to like him anyway. Uh, number five, it was better to play against the media than to the media. Number six, the media's claim to be the protector of factual probity and accuracy was itself a sham. The number seven, the Trump revolution was an attack on conventional assumptions and expertise. So better to embrace Trump's behavior than try to curb it or cure it. So those, I guess those are Bannon's justifications for why it was okay that Trump lies constantly. The problem was that for all he was never going to stick to a script, his mind just doesn't work that way, was one of the internal rationalizations. Trump craved media approval. But, as Bannon emphasized, he was never going to get the facts right, nor was he ever going to acknowledge that he got them wrong, so therefore he was not going to get that approval. This meant, next best thing, that he had to be aggressively defended against the media's disapproval. Um, the problem here was that the more vociferous the defense, mostly of assertions that could easily be proved wrong, the more the media redoubled its attacks and censure. What's more, Trump was receiving the censure of his friends, too. And it was not only calls from friends worried about him, but staffers calling people to call him and say, simmer down. Who do you have in there, said Joe Scarborough in a frantic call. Who's the person you trust? Jared, who can you talk through this stuff before you decided to act on it? Well, said the president, you won't like the answer, but the answer is me. Me. I talk to myself. Uh, <laughs> um, hence, within 24 hours of the inauguration, the president had invented a million or so people who did not exist. He sent his new press secretary, Sean Spicer, whose personal mantra, mantra would shortly become, you can't make this shit up. 
to argue his case in a media moment that turned Spicer, uh, quite a button-down political professional, into a national joke, which he seemed destined never to recover from, to never recover from. To boot, the president blamed Spicer for not making the million phantom souls seem real. <laughs> Again, a, a lot of times, yeah, his lying is like, you know, I don't know. Later on, they talk about Trump doesn't understand cause and effect. <laughs> he doesn't understand, like, which... I say the know, same thing like, about my eight-month-old or my nine-month-old. <laughs> 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 yep. It's uh it's something he never got apparently. Yeah. yeah. Um but yeah. Hmm. Was, okay, sorry, I'm coming I'll edit this part, but I'm I'm kinda like trying to get the context of this last quote I have underlined in this uh in this thing. Um in this chapter. Hmm. Uh Okay, okay, so in this last quote I've underlined here, Trump is in the middle of a very, very, very long quote, and he's talking about his inauguration. And he said, and they said Donald Trump did not draw well, and I said it was almost raining. The rain should have scared them away, but God looked down and said, we're not going to let it rain on your speech. And in fact, when it's, I start, I first started, I said, oh, no. First line, I got hit by a couple drops, and I said, oh, this is too bad. We'll go, we'll go right through it. The truth is, it stopped immediately. No, it didn't, one of the staffers traveling with him said reflectively, then catching herself and with a worried look, glancing around to see if she had been overheard. <laughs> so, so very clearly, even within his own staff and, you know, people know when he's lying, they, they don't believe him. Yeah. And they just try not to say anything publicly that he's going to hear to disagree with. Yeah. I, I am glad that Michael Wolff included such long quotes from this ridiculous CIA speech, because I do remember that speech from when it happened. And it was just the most bizarre rambling uh, thing you can imagine. And obviously, like they say in the book, it was the first place he stopped because, of course, he'd compared uh, this to like Nazis during you know the previous days and then tried to blame it on the media but um, <laughs> apparently he brought his own like cheering section to the speech uh, not mm -hmm. unlike he did when he first uh, announced his uh, his candidacy coming down the golden escalator I guess all the people that were there for that uh, were um, were paid so <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah, that I mean, yeah, I think I think they talk about that. That people had advised him that his first stop needed to be the CIA, and he needed to, you know, honor and show respect to the CIA. So he was going to have a, a war with them, basically. And he just went in there and just talked about himself, basically. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah disgraceful. So. In front of the wall of, of CIA officers that have died in the line of duty, have also so that was nice. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you watch The Sopranos, Tony Soprano has better, you know awareness of what he's supposed to say in most given social situations <laughs> I mean I mean in the fifth or sixth season when they were going to war with New York or whatever I mean he gave a rousing speech even though it was his own cousin's fault that the war had started I mean <laughs> I can't try to do something like that oh you mean, you mean cousin Tony or whatever yeah I think so it was either Tony or it was uh, or it was uh, Christopher oh, oh Chris, yeah mm-hmm I forget the speech. It was like, um, he said something like, uh, I know you guys say, you know, he's like, I'd do the same for any of you, even if you weren't my cousin. And I know you guys say, oh, Tony, we, we would never do that. And he's like, and he's like, God forbid. And I, I, I know you wouldn't, but. And like, it was actually like quite a, quite a good speech. I thought uh -huh. the highlights of the speech, speech making of that show, I think. Oh Yeah. But um, later on in the book, I think there's an interesting there's I mean there's interesting stuff in here because okay so for example earlier today when I was on the way up to the high school I read a section about about Saudi Arabia that is very interesting and I can't wait to get to that section mm -hmm. and about how Donald Trump's friendship may have helped upend and relate and lead to a you know a kind of a change in the um who's going to be the crown prince, basically, of the, the Saad family. Mm. 
and it was a it was a very concise like two or three paragraph uh, description of that. And then I, I ended up reading this thing on the Washington Post about how Jared Kushner is working with the, the this guy and the Saudi family, and mm-hmm. how he's had mixed success. And maybe if he can work with the Saudis, then it's going to help him with the Middle East peace and all this stuff. And the and frankly, the article I read was just incoherent, and it was like it was kind of like. It was, I mean, Michael Wolf did a much better job, I felt, um, explaining exactly what had happened. Mm-hmm. And from the article you read on the Washington Post, I mean, nothing against them. I think they do good reporting a lot of the time. But this article, if you read it not knowing anything about how this had all come to pass, you would really come away quite confused, I thought. I almost sent you the article. Mm. I didn't have to look it up and try to find that. But, um, but it was just like there was no sense of cause and effect. There was no sense of, like, who this person is, how he came to power, how he used the Trump meetings and stuff to come to power, how he was regarded, I mean, why he's regarded the way he's regarded by Mm -hmm. the establishment, uh, uh, State Department in America and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. And just a bunch of stuff like that. And, like, what had happened with with Qatar, Qatar, however you pronounce it. um, Yeah. Stuff like that. How mm-hmm. how Donald Trump and literally thought that it was just going to be very easy to create peace with uh, Israel and Palestine and all this stuff. How he thinks there's only four countries you have to worry about, which were like Saudi Arabia, Israel, uh, Egypt, and Iran. And he said like three of those countries don't like Iran, so you can you can piss off Iran without suffering too much, and you can basically make the other three just force the Palestinians to accept peace. Yes, the very stable genius. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, to some degree, every president goes in thinking they're going to try to, they've got a new idea for Middle East peace, and it never works. Mm-hmm. But this is remarkably naive. I mean, this is like, I, I can't even imagine that George W. Bush was this naive about the situation going into it. So mm-hmm. Totally. Well, I probably ought to get to, uh, yeah, I got to get to work here, but, um, yeah, wouldn't bring us to chapter four. So keep, uh, keep reading listeners and, uh, back with you. Same bat channel, same bat time or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Keep watching the news. Who knows what's going to happen? I, I think, you know, I, I hope Robert, Robert Mueller needs to pull the trigger on this thing and just say, you're indicted motherfucker. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And um, I think at least at the very least at right now, we need to get Jared. Just, he needs to pull the trigger on Jared. We all know it's coming. We all know him and John Don Jr. are getting, uh, indicted. Just do it, man. Just do it. <laughs> oh, also, uh, Don Jr. Uh, getting divorced. I saw that. Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. <laughs> <laughs> I would have thought Milani would have been the one. <laughs> I guess Jr. is going to get a divorce first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Like I always told my son, you gotta have, you gotta have, uh, you gotta have the uh, prenup. He didn't, he didn't believe me. Something probably Donald Trump has better divorce lawyers than Don Jr. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. (laughs) We'll we'll see, we'll see how his impeachment lawyer is. It sounds like he's trying to get Clinton's old one. Mm Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, we may, uh, we may, may be back sooner rather than later, depending on what happens in the news today. So, <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep some of my evenings open. Maybe we can get a couple more chapters in. Yeah, let's evening. definitely do that. All right, all right. Well, have a good day at work, there, Bob, and uh, have a nice week, listeners. And we'll be back with you soon. Cool. All right, later on. Okay, bye bye.
If you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways to support it. Join the Rob Burgess Show mailing list. Go to tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show and type in your email address. Then respond to the automatic message. I have a Patreon account, which can be found at patreon.com forward slash Rob Burgess Show Patreon. I hope you'll consider supporting in any amount. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available, including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Facebook, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, and RSS. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. And if you have something to say, record a voice memo on your smartphone and send it to the Rob Burgess Show at gmail.com. Include voice memo in the subject line of the email. Until next time.